Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. If you want to take it behind the curtain, remember, taking your emails now, jackberkman2016 at gmail, 2016 at gmail, coming into the 20th century, not yet the 21st, maybe never the 21st. Same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, we will never quit. On the rich family, the city of Washington, and this country, we will find the killer or killers of Seth. More on that soon. Joining us now, Michael D. Tanner, senior fellow at Cato Institute and author of Going for Broke, Deficits, Debt, and the Entitlement Crisis. With Michael, we want to talk about just how far left the left has gone. Michael, welcome. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, pleasure is all ours. I, I'll tell you, looking at Camilla Harris, now, I don't think she really believes some of this. You'd have to be, if they really believe this, I, I get the sense, maybe Elizabeth Warren does. I don't think, I think Camilla Harris is too smart. I think she's just playing the part. But the left has now moved all the way off the cliff. They are, no pun intended, at the left wall because now they want massive new taxes on stock trades. They want to bring back something like a 90 or 100 percent inheritance tax, a la George McGovern. Uh, They want income tax back up to probably 70 or 80 percent or more on the top bracket. Right. What given how bad is this? You're you're absolutely right that on fiscal issues, the Democratic Party seems to have moved to the left. Uh, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders uh, four years ago was something of an outlier with his support for Medicare for all and free college, jobs for everybody, a $15 an hour minimum wage. And today that's pretty much uh, supported by every one of the candidates that has jumped in so far. So they're talking some $50 million, $50 uh, trillion dollars over 10 years. That's a good spending. point that Bernie Bernie was an outlier. But now Bernie, whether Bernie runs again in uh, in 2020, Bernie's philosophy has effectively taken over the party. In some sense, in Democratic circles, he won. He has won. Well, he certainly did succeed in moving the base of the party, and the base now is uh, is largely younger, more activist. And, of course, there's kind of an equal and opposite reaction in politics when you have uh, President Trump, who's moved the Republican Party considerably to the right uh, and largely uh, on fiscal issues as well. Uh, you see a the reaction in the Democratic Party moving the other way. By the way, we're just by, for, I, I visibly advertising Starbucks. We love Howard Schultz, guys. We want him to run, Howard, run, and screw the Democrats. So we're going to be having a lot of Starbucks on the set. So Howard makes enough money to pay for that campaign. That's a topic for another day. Okay, so, Michael, is there anything, the danger of this, I mean, Imagine a situation where we had any one of these crazy Dems, even a Biden who's probably not as crazy as the others, or maybe he is, we just don't know yet. Any one of these Dems gets in, and you have Speaker Pelosi, much less Leader Schumer, but even if you had McConnell, there wouldn't be much he could do. He would be overwhelmed. Walk me through the horror scenario so voters know what could happen. Well, I, I mean, I think for sort of moderate voters in the middle, they're, they're back to another hold your nose and pick one of the lesser of evils elections. Uh, what you have is a lot of voters, particularly suburban voters and those in swing states who are sort of appalled at President Trump. And, well, no, no, I know that. Diff- a horse of a different color. Well, I know that. That's setting the stage. Good job setting the stage of the election. But what I'm saying is imagine if a Democrat won and you had President Harris or President Sanders and Speaker Pelosi. Tell us what that might look like in terms of policy. Well, certainly what you're going to see is a massive increase in spending uh, and debt. You're going to see higher taxes on the wealthy, all of which will slow down the economy. We're going to see much lower economic growth. Uh, We're going to see far fewer jobs created. We basically could return to the stagflation that we've seen in the last, you know, a few decades ago. Democrats have effectively kind of hit the wall, haven't they? No pun intended. I mean, they've, they've, they've gone some of this stuff. You, if you go, you really can't go any further because they're now I mean, it would seem to me Camilla Harris and Bernie Sanders are now talking about a world that's beyond where France is now. Right. I mean, they're going beyond that. France and Italy, despite the current leadership there. Well, Italy conservative, but these countries are, are privatizing in some sense. They're all moving right because they have to. They hit the wall, too. But what these people are talking about is taking America beyond where Europe is, right? 
Well, yeah, they're not just beyond where France and Italy are, but well beyond where Denmark and Sweden and oh. uh, the countries like that are. I mean, those countries actually have freer labor markets in many ways than we do and lower capital gains taxes than these candidates are talking about. Uh, they have a high overall tax burden, but largely because they rely on a value-added tax, which hits uh, lower and middle-class incomes, not so much because of their high personal tax rate. I always love when people point point to a high uh, income per capita in places like Sweden and, and Sweden and Norway. I said, well, yeah, but there's only seven or eight million people in Sweden. That's almost like saying, look at these uh, look at these nine Eskimos who live up near the Arctic Circle. Look how they live in peace in socialism. I mean, that's what that's like. Those countries. I think the total population of Scandinavia is less than 30 million. It's less than downstate New York or something. It's ridiculous. But anyway, that, that be that as it may, it's a topic for another day. So they let me ask you this. Do you think these Democrats are just mouthing the platitudes because they have to appeal to a base that has become wacky? Or do you think they really believe most of this stuff? No. Well, I, I mean, do you think to some degree they probably believe it? But I think it's also driven by the way electoral politics are today, that both parties have really retreated to their bases. And then there's very little effort to appeal to the center, that uh, the candidates really are right now trying to simply turn out as many of their base supporters as they can. The the assumption used to be that you won elections by that 20 percent in the middle. Today, I think that that's largely been abandoned. The idea is that if you can turn out your base more than the other guy can turn out their base, that's what brings victory. Because the bases have grown, so swing voters and independents mean less than they did 30 years ago. Yeah, that, that's pretty much it, that the bases uh, have grown and the center kind of is turned off uh, and doesn't tend to vote as much anymore. Interesting. So where do you see this going? So do you see, will there be... Now, the one thing the Democrats, if you go... So they, they all have to race left. Like, obviously, Camilla Harris wants to now occupy the left poll. She wants to say, I'm going to come out of the box strong with African-American vote heading into the South and South Carolina. Uh, I have a California fundraising base, and more importantly than either of those things, I'm going to go completely far to the left, preempt all the space on the left, maybe much in the same way Trump has preempted the space on the right, and I am going to be the socialist that the base will love. Now, where does that leave them for the general? Let's assume that any one of these crazies wins, whether it's Camilla Harris or Biden or Sanders or Warren, any one of the nut- nutcases wins – then what? Then it, Trump, they might be easy fodder for Trump because they're not going to be able to walk back this. Then we run against them like George McGovern, like we ran against McGovern, right? Or is it different? Well, I, I think it's a little bit different because it, Donald Trump is so polarizing in and himself. What you're going to do is have two candidates, both of whom appeal to their base, both of whom rev up their base. Uh, but neither of whom really can reach out beyond that base and draw in any remaining voters there in the middle. Uh, it's going to be that makes for a very nasty race because it's all about how much you can get your voters excited. Uh, we're going to see very negative campaigning on both sides, I think. Let me ask you this, historian that you are. Did the same thing happen late 60s, early 70s, like Karl Rove compared 16 to 68 it might we compare 20 to 72 that is the bases were revved up you know the chicago 7 the craziness all the bases in 68 were revved up to the moon right but then the democrats in 72 had to live with the upshot of that with the concomitant of that which was george mcgovern but they couldn't get him elected now nixon probably was a stronger candidate in 72 than trump will be in 20 because he didn't have the baggage in 72 that trump has now but you see a cycle similar to that repeating itself. Yeah, that's potentially the case. And I do think you draw an interesting distinction. I think on the left, that's very much uh, the case. Uh, on the right, uh, Nixon, of course, was much more centrist than Trump is. Uh, so he had an easier job at reaching out. But mm. you did have a case uh, of where you had, uh, you know, the one party that sort of self-destructed. And that's the, what the Democrats face as a danger now. So if you had to predict, let me ask you this, where do you see the Democratic primary going? Do you think who who do you see as a front runner now? How do you see it evolving? Where does it go? Well, I think there's kind of going to be two primaries in the Democratic Party, if you will. One is going to be on the left, and that's the question of Kamala Harris 
Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. Uh, the candidates have gotten in so far seem to be trying for that lane, that they can be the base candidate. And then the question is, will there be a more moderate candidate of sort of the old Obama wing of the party, Joe Biden, perhaps, if he gets in, uh, Michael Bloomberg, somebody like that who can get in and sort of run as uh, – you know the less controversial candidate, and then the, those those are ultimately going you to you know be it's interesting off. pressing forth the analogy to sixty eight in the Democrats even further, right? Because what did you have? Hubert Humphrey in the center, you would have had Bobby Kennedy on the left, you had McCarthy on the left, right? Even a little bit of McGovern. Then isn't that what you had? Is it the same thing all over again? I'm yeah, that would be uh, that would be a pretty good analogy, and, and uh, you know that's really going to split the Democratic Party, I think. Uh, and it's going to tell us which direction they're going to go for the future. Uh, you know, is the is the average Democratic voter a Kamala Harris voter or a Joe Biden voter? And that we don't know. Michael D. Tanner, senior fellow at the Cato Institute, author of Going for Broke, Deficits, Debt, and the Entitlement Crisis. Michael, thank you so much. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. If you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us 703-795-5364. Taking your emails, Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. And remember, we got to drink Starbucks. We got to make Howard richer, Howard Schultz, make him rich as he can so he can be the new Ralph Nader I want Howard to win about 10 states. Well, maybe eight. Eight would be good. Ten would be good. We want Howard to do really well in 2020. Joining us now, Juan Carlos Hidalgo, policy analyst on Latin America Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity. Welcome, Juan. How are you? Now, what was the Thank treaty? Now, what was the treaty that ended the Mexican-American War? Was it Guadalupe Hidalgo? How close am I? Am I right? Well, the U.S. that one. You got me on that one. I think that your I, name it is sounds the, like it. <laughs> that name is that a city in Mexico? That's a famous name. It, it, that's a that ended Guadalupe, and that's the treaty that ended the Mexican American War. Uh, I think. All right. All right. Well, Jesus, Juan, you're supposed to know this. You're the Latin American expert. <laughs> Gee, many cricket. All right. Okay. All right. Well, that's all right. We'll forgive you, Venezuela. Venezuela, getting rid of Mr. Maduro. I know you have been following this, writing about this. Are we on the right path with backing his adversary? Will it work? After it works, what do we do then? I mean, there, there cannot be a guarantee that it's going to work. If it were something easy to do to this large uh, dictatorship that has been uh, that has been. Uh, uh, around for, for such a long time, uh, it would have happened already. But I think that the combination of factors that we are seeing in Venezuela right now, uh, a united opposition under a single leadership. Uh, which hasn't happened, I guess, which never happened before, has not happened, in, happened before. in decades. Uh, the, 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 the opposition in, in, in Venezuela has been historically uh, tremendously uh, fracture, uh, fracture and dysfunctional. But now, they all recognize the leadership of Juan Guaido, who is the president of the National Assembly, and who was uh, sworn in as the president uh, interim of, of Venezuela. The other factor is uh, the number of Venezuelans that Juan Maduro gone, 80 percent, according to more than 80 percent, according to surveys and polls. And they all are rallying behind uh, Guaido. A recent poll shows that 83 percent of Venezuelans consider him the legitimate president of Venezuela. And on top of that, you have international pressure, and not only diplomatic pressure, but now we see economic pressure as well. Uh, now, the, the, where are, let me ask you this, entities like the OAS and Mercosur and all of the south of the border entities, where are these countries, Central and Latin, Central and South America, where are these countries? Are they all in alignment with the U.S. on the change, or do is. some still support Maduro? No, indeed, and this is interesting because this is this wasn't the case up until like four years ago. Up, to, up until four years ago, most of the governments in Latin America were left wing, and they were supported or uh, uh, Venezuela. But now, most of the governments in, in the region are center right, and they are uh, not recognizing Maduro as the, as the president of Venezuela, and instead recognizing Guaido. They created a group called the Grupo de Lima, the Lima Group 
which includes Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Costa Rica, Canada. And what's the Lima and, Group do? I hadn't heard it. What's the Lima Group do? It's an ad hoc group that was created to deal with Venezuela. The Got problem it. with the OAS is that it requires some, for some decisions, like suspending the membership of, of, of Venezuela, for example, it will require a two-third vote of members. And, and Venezuela still has the backing of certain countries in the region. And that's my question. That's interesting. What countries do still support them? Do we know? Who's, who's quietly supporting Maduro? You have Bolivia, who also has a left-wing uh, will-be dictator, Hugo it. Morales. You have uh, El Salvador, whose government is the former Marxist guerrilla, uh, the FMLN. You have Nicaragua, where they have another dictator, Daniel Ortega. Uh, Mexico is, unfortunately, uh, a, a big country that until recently was part of the Lima Group, uh, with, but they changed governments in Mexico, and now they have a left-wing populist in power, and they have uh, changed track on regarding Venezuela. No, so it, it's interesting in Mexico, the Mexicans, so the Mexican people, even though they've elect, left a, a left-wing version of Trump in Mexico, it's, it's, I find it it's strange that, they would, that the people would find Maduro popular. Why would they want? That doesn't, that's still strange, don't you think? I don't think that, that uh, Mexicans are particularly fond of, 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 of Maduro. The reason why they voted for Lopez Obrador so overwhelmingly had to do more with uh, corruption. They were fed up with corruption in Mexico, with low growth, with uh, a, a violence, and they wanted something new. Maybe and Mexico that, wants populism to— populism usually comes out, you know, out of the open. In, in, How— I mean, in some sense, south of the border, you really only have two countries. You have Brazil and Mexico, right? That's most of the GDP. The rest of it's very small. The rest of it's tiny. So you only have two countries that matter. So what is Mexico? Is Mexico actively pushing? Are they active? What is their role? How actively are they supporting Maduro? I'm curious. Not actively. They actually even corrected uh, a map that was displayed by the by the State Department that showed Mexico as one of the countries supporting Maduro. They claimed, we're not supporting Maduro, we're just neutral. We're not taking a position. The historic uh, diplomatic stance of Mexico when it comes to world affairs was not interference in, in other countries' internal affairs. That changed, that began to change in the late 1990s. And uh, in, the, in the last couple of governments of Mexico, uh, with Felipe Calderón of the Conservative PAN and, and Enrique Peña Nieto of the PRI, they became more involved and more active in diplomacy, and they were a, a key part of the, of the Lima Group. However, with López Obrador, they decided to go back to their old uh, policy of not interference in, in, in the affairs of other countries. So they claim that they're not taking position. Is the, let me ask you this. Time, a couple of minutes remaining. Is the American strategy working? Will Huedo take power... Or will Maduro be able to stage a comeback? What's what's happening there? I think it's a 50-50, But let's let's keep let's keep note. Uh, let's take note of, of the latest uh, decision of the United States to hand out the, the control of Citgo, which is the subsidiary of PDVSA, the state company of, of Venezuela. Hand out the the, the control of Citgo to uh, Guaido and the people who Guaido is going to appoint to that company. That means that. This is going to cut off the, the all income uh, of Venezuela, of uh, uh, the Maduro regime, at least in the short term. And that's a major blow to Maduro. And we'll see if that is going to change the minds of the military, because ultimately this is, a, is, is, is all about that. You know, the military is the ultimate arbiter in this in this uh, standoff. And as long as they stick with Maduro, Maduro is safe in power. All right. Juan Carlos Hidalgo, policy analyst, Latin America, Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, and all-around expert on all things south of the border. Juan, if we're real lucky, we'll be able to have you back again. where everything is depicted as a Washington Post political cartoon. Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. We're taking your emails now as we enter the 20th century, not the 21st. Jack Berkman, 2016 at Gmail, 2016 at Gmail. Same number, same email. If you know anything about the Seth Rich murder mystery, well, joining us now, Ilya Shapiro, frequent contributor to this program, but that's the least of his wonderful resume. He's the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. 
Uh, before Cato, he was a special advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues. Ilya, welcome back. Good to be back. Well, this, let's talk Supreme Court. Let's talk the wonderful world of SCOTUS, where this program hasn't gone in some time, at least since Kavanaugh. Our friend Brett Kavanaugh, what would you say has been the impact on the court thus far, in terms of rulings, demeanor, all the way around? What are you seeing? Well, there, there haven't been too many uh, rulings from the court uh, altogether, one that, that, that Kavanaugh uh, wrote or participated in or, or, or anything, uh, which is not unexpected. It's very early in the term. term goes until June, of course, uh, and there are 60-some, 70 cases that they'll be deciding. Um, uh, more kind of inside the inside baseball scuttlebutt about is he joining with Thomas and Gorsuch on uh, dissents from denial of cert, meaning which cases are they taking up? Is he siding with John Roberts to be more moderate? And there's a bit of all of that, but that's that's what uh, us insiders call the shadow. So how, that is. how is it shaping up now? In theory, the court now should be it should be a solid five four or even six three conservative majority, right? But then our, the problem is Johnny Roberts, the turncoat, right? Isn't well, that in, where we are? In, in John Roberts is the median vote. I won't call him the, the swing vote. I mean, he's he's not going to be like Kennedy. He's going to you know, in you can't predict uh, what he's going to do. But he he tries to moderate the court. He tries to take small steps rather than ruling broadly uh, when you can. And so once these substantive decisions start coming down, we'll start seeing whether Kavanaugh is more towards the middle with Roberts or more towards the, the conservative or original you know, I'm kind of with, presuming with he's Thomas. he's going to be with Thomas and Alito and the conserv- I'm I'm presuming that. Is that a bad presumption? Are there, are there elements of him that are confusing? So, so there, there's, there's some nuance there. I think you're right on the substance. When they actually decide issues, and, you know, the, the rubber hits the road, I think he, he probably is more towards Gorsuch and Thomas and Alito. But in some of these decisions about whether to take a case, how broadly to rule, whether to issue a stay, meaning to, to stop the lower court action pending appeal, there he may be kind of more cagey and small p political alongside Roberts. Okay. But again, we don't know yet. Let's look at this. How close are the court to taking action on some of the biggies? The, the obvious one, abortion. Do we need one more? In other words, my thinking is we've got to put another Gorsuch there or another Kavanaugh in place of when Ginsburg finally retires uh, or Breyer retires or what have you. We need one more, which could take a Trump second term. It looks like it'll take a second term if there is one or some other Republican or whatever. Uh, I don't think we have quite the votes for abortion. What do you think on that? Well, it depends what you mean by that, because the governing rule isn't Roe v. Wade. It's Planned Parenthood versus Casey, Casey. 25 years ago, which changed Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade essentially put in a trimester rubric that you can't really restrict during the first uh, uh, trimester. During the third, you pretty much can. In the middle, it's kind of a sliding scale based on viability. Casey said kind of undue burden, which is, uh, you know, the joke is well, an undue burden is something that gives uh, Anthony Kennedy a headache. Well, of course, Kennedy is gone now. So I think we're going to see in- incremental steps upholding certain kind of restrictions that might otherwise be struck down. And in effect, put, going back to the Roe v. Wade regime, which was in place from the early 70s until 1992. But I think you're right. To, well, let me ask you a broader to, question. Do we have the votes? To, the, if the goal is to overturn Roe v. Wade altogether, that would take another justice, because I, I can't see John Roberts willing to overturn it altogether. Okay, so that answers my question. There, we're, we're basically, to overturn the whole thing, uh, kit and caboodle, we need one more. So that, but if we get, so we're likely to get one more. I guess it depends a lot on whether Trump is reelected. Looking how all this impacts 2020, if Trump is reelected, we'll certainly get that one more. If he's not, then the issue is whether Ginsburg holds out until... Uh, well, if she holds to the middle of 2020, they won't be able to get one through anyway. I guess it all depends on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's right. And, and I think the Supreme Court is going to be, and judicial nominations are going to be even more of an issue in the 2020 elections than they were in 2016 with uh, the vacancy caused by Scalia's uh, untimely passing. And, you know, the, all the experts say, the, the, the statisticians, that Trump would not have won the election were it not for that Supreme Court vacancy. Tell us about the recent Second Amendment case. What's happening now? The court's taken a Second Amendment case, first one in, what, a decade, eight or ten years, something like that. What do you see here? Yeah, that's right. It's been really frustrating 
since the court declared an individual right uh, in Heller, the, the, the D.C. case in 2008, wow. and then two years later applied that to the state, striking down a similar Chicago ban, uh, it hasn't taken uh, a right to keep bear arms case, even as the lower courts are all over the place, both in terms of result and in terms of how you va- evaluate challenges uh, to to gun regulations. So it's time now to clean it up. This is going to be a good time for the court to clean all this stuff up. Do you think they're going to promulgate a new rule that, that is clear, or is it going to lead to more chaos, or what do you think is going to happen? I mean, that is the question. Uh, the, 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 the regulation at issue is out of New York, New York City, prohibits you from transporting your gun past state law, past city lines, sorry. So let's say you have a vacation home or a gun range or you want to hunt or something. Uh, you, can't, you can't transport it that, that way. Uh, so it, it's about the right to, uh, to carry arms in, in that sense, even though you're transporting it unloaded, disassembled, all the rest of it. Uh, and the more important, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that they'll strike down this uh, rather draconian uh, restriction. But the question is, what kind of standard will they establish for looking at uh, res- other kinds of restrictions going forward? Because we have in, in California, the Ninth Circuit, in New Jersey, in the, in the Third Circuit, in New York, in the Second Circuit, these courts are really uh, engaged in civil disobedience, effectively saying, unless it's a complete ban on guns, we're going we're gonna to uphold all these restrictions. So looking ahead to 2020, Ilya, now you make the good point that this whole Supreme Court, the Supreme Court will be more of an issue in 2020 maybe than it has ever been before in a national election. Who benefits more from the rallying? I would think the left benefits more that the mobilization advantage it plays to their base because they know abortion is on the line. Republicans won't say that, but abortion, the whole right to abortion is on the line in 2020, right? In theory, the, the court's been uh, an issue every time. It really depends on who the candidate is and how credible he or she can make it. Hillary Clinton could have made more of an issue of the vacancy and simply did not allow uh, Donald Trump to occupy that space. Probably the next Democratic nominee is not going to make that mistake. But it's not just about abortion, obviously. It's about the executive power over whether it's immigration or gun regulation or a whole host of, of other things. We, we can't really predict how the issues are going to shape up in terms of uh, this battle over the Supreme Court. Ilya Shapiro, director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at Cato, former special advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on all rule of law and legal issues. Ilya, thank you so much. If we're real lucky, we'll be able to have you back again. But remember, if you want to go behind the curtain, you call us 703-795-5364. Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. Jack Berkman 2016 at Gmail. All the stories and controversies that no one talks about, but everyone should know about. Why don't you get a toupee with some brains in it? Behind the Curtain with Jack Berkman. Welcome back. Remember, if you want to take it behind the curtain, you call us, 703-795-5364, 703-795-5364. Operators standing by, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday, taking your emails, jackberkman2016 at gmail, jackberkman2016 at gmail. Joining us now, oh, very special guest, Mike Torricelli, my good friend. Mike, uh, for those of you who may not know him, he's one of the foremost experts in the United States and indeed the world on opioid dependency treatment. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Great to have you here on Radio America and to our Newsmax audience as well. Well, Mike, you've saved, now Trump, as you know, the, the reason we're so interested, everyone is so interested in this topic because opioid dependency treatment has become a huge issue for the president. As you may know, the president's older brother about 30 years ago died of drugs and alcohol. It's a terrible thing. So the Trump family has fought looking for treatment solutions for many, many years. This goes back to when Trump was a young man. This is, I can tell you, this is one of the president's passions and what you do is viewed as so important uh, by the White House. Let me start out by asking you, just so our viewers know, give me a sense of how many lives you have saved, because this is really breathtaking well, you for know, the country. I, I, I don't like to say I've saved lives. You know, it's really the individual that's got to get in and do the work. I've been involved in, in about 15,000 cases wow. over the last 29 years. Okay. Wow. I've flown over four million miles doing uh, family crisis interventions and done over 700 interventions. So that's where you get involved uh, with uh, somebody that's got a problem. 
that doesn't admit that they have a problem. And so we get all the loved ones together. We sit down with them in a very compassionate way, and we work through a process that's designed to, to pull them out of their denial and put them in a position where they can hold their head high when it's time to make a decision to get help. Now, as the be very effective. 15,000 yeah. lives. Wow. I would applaud if I could. Let me ask you this. As a national expert, do you generally agree with the way the president wants to deal with this? Well, I, I think originally when he, when he came out, uh, it was about maybe uh, 17, 18 months ago and talked about, you know, uh, dealing with it with grants. Okay. Uh, the the problem is the the industry is completely and totally ineffective. Okay, and it's, it's why is that? Design. Tell us why that is. Why don't you tell tell our viewers why that uh, is? I, they, so many people well, would like to know. It's because there's a there's a cookie cutter approach to all types of uh, addicts. Okay, they they treat an alcoholic the same way that they would treat somebody that's on meth. And uh, or and somebody that's on opiates, including heroin, and then then you have the the uh, adulterated opiates, which are you know the opioids, uh, which are the you know like the fentanyl laced heroin that we see so much of. It is causing about thirty five hundred deaths a week. Okay, which is astronomical. We've never seen anything like it. Okay. The death rate in certain areas of the country is up a thousand percent. Now, let me okay. get this straight. Just so, just on heroin, just on heroin and related drugs, we're looking at three thousand five hundred deaths a week. Is that what I heard you a say? Week. A, a week. A week in the United States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's twice as many as are killed in car accidents, even more than that. And I think the figure is very conservative because a lot of the deaths are caused by uh, blood infections. Because uh, the contaminants that are put in the, in these uh, 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 drugs that are sold on the street. And oh, so I see. So I somebody a, might die of an, an infection. Idea. I see. Some, there could be another 3,500 dying yeah. of infections, and we don't it, even know. It, exactly. I I've, got, I've got a kid in the hospital right now, a 27-year-old, where he had an abscess and the infection. It's turned into MRSA, and it's going into his heart. Oh, and so they're giving them about a about a thirty percent chance of living, and this all happened within about a three day period, and we see this all the time. Okay, so it's not just just the uh, well. First of all, fentanyl is such a powerful uh, drug, and and the difference between heroin and fentanyl is that fentanyl is made by scientists in a laboratory. It is a, what we call a synthetic opiate. Okay. Whereas heroin is comes from the opium poppy, and it's actually a lot healthier for you than, than uh, the adulterated uh, versions. This whole mess started uh, with the advent of oxycotton. You might remember back in the in you know the late nineties uh, when when uh, the, uh, there was a pharmaceutical company called Purdue Pharma. Yeah, yeah, I do it remember. Came that. out with this drug, uh, uh, OxyContin, which was supposed to be the the uh, you know uh, you know best possible painkiller when it came to people with HIV or people that were dying or, or losing limbs or dying from cancer or uh, had t t level ten pain levels. Okay. What happened was the doctors got a hold of this, and uh, and and that's when the pill mills started. Okay, they they uh, started recruiting uh, patients, and they were prescribing them oxycotton every month, and they'd go in, pay their two hundred and fifty dollars, and get their prescription every month. Well, if you do the math, okay, if you have four hundred patients coming in there for three minutes to get that prescription every month. Uh, you do the math. I mean, four hundred uh, times two fifty. Boy, this is I see now. Month. Okay, so yeah. this is being driven. This this problem then is being driven. And correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but by a combination of maybe lax federal policy up until now, lax laws, police not knowing what to do, pill mills, and evil docs. I mean, it seems to me this is like a hydra headed monster. We've got a, this that, is this is a complicated exactly problem. Right. It's a, it's no simple solution. There's a number of different problems that need to be addressed. Now, Trump did a good job. Stepping in and and, and uh, 
making the DEA stepped in and they really made some changes. They, they revoked a lot of doctors' licenses and they have really, uh, really uh, scrutinized uh, the, the prescribing of, uh, of Do you of, think they uh, should just opiates. should they just outlaw something like oxycotton altogether? May, is that the solution? Maybe outlaw these things? Can we outlaw? Well, you know, you know, the, the problem with that, Jack, is, and that's what we're seeing is uh, that people go to the street to get it, and then there's no quality control, and then they're going to get it one way or the other. As long as there's a supply, there's going to be a demand. There's going to be a supply. We saw it back, you know, in the Reagan era, you know, where Nancy got on TV and she said, just say no. Well, that's not the way it works with an addict, okay? As long as we have 15% of the population that wants to use this stuff, you, it's going to be available. And the problem with, with uh, this fentanyl is the Chinese have figured out a way to make it real cheap. And uh, it's not like heroin where you have to ship over tons and tons of the product to 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 you know to to get it over the over the border what they're doing is they are mailing it they're upsing it they're federal expressing it and so that's how it's getting into the country uh one brick of, of fentanyl is the equivalent of a whole room of heroin so they're using the fentanyl wow. to, to cut the heroin okay in your mind, the law enforcement stuff, harder law enforcement, outlawing more police, all that stuff, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that doesn't really work, according it's to you, too well, do because anything. because no, pe- people no. buy it from the pushers in the street, right? Yeah, it's not going to do anything at all. I mean, uh, the wall is a great idea, but you know what? If, if they'll find other ways of getting it in. Uh, it's a very small percent, you know, comes across the border there. Like I said, the fentanyl is being shipped in, and uh, it's coming in, you know, uh, across the, the Canadian border for the most part when they carry it in. But it's being mailed at the end is 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 the deal. It's very hard to detect, and you can't check every package that comes across. There's there's no, you know, uh, uh, reliable way to know if, if fentanyl is, is being shipped. Uh, and these guys are real slick. You know, this Mexican mafia, let me tell you, this is a trillion-dollar business, and they know what the hell they're doing. And they know how to get it in here, and they know how to distribute it, okay? And they're focusing on our young people. What used to be the last house on the block, which is heroin, uh, has now become a very popular, very in-crowd type of drug so that where lies the problem and of course um you know it, it's uh it's a dead end street it's uh okay let me ask you this gonna end up, you, yeah. you may know this homeland security now spends about three quarters of its budget fighting the mexican drug war basically or more yeah, yeah. now is waste that time yeah. is that so that's basically a complete waste of time because a it's not effective b even if you could shut it off from there it comes from other places all of this has become a joke yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I saw a bit on, on Fox News um, a few weeks ago, and these are the people that originally contacted me. It was Chris Christie and Dr. William Baum of the ONTCP, which is the Office on National Drug Policy, okay? Yeah. And I had a, there was 150 people on the phone, and they asked me a series of questions, and uh, – one of which was, uh, you know, uh, how do we put a dent in this, Mike? You know, what, what do we do? And the deal is there's no, you know, simple answer to this. With the, the treatment plans we have available, we are set up for failure. The treatment centers uh, countrywide are actually rewarded for failure, okay? Um, I, I was on the phone with a kid yesterday that's been a treatment 27 times okay Jesus. and how old is now, he? how old is, is that boy yeah uh, he's only he's 29 years old oh my so lord and 27 times from rehab to rehab and and see this is what has happened without unintentionally what what happened with obamacare as well intended as it may have been i never was a backer of obamacare because i worked in the insurance industry uh but when you get the, the federal government involved and you make the rules, when you eliminate the pre-existing condition, okay, number one, 
And number two, you make it readily available, then all the crooks uh, creep out of the woodwork, okay? And so now we found ourselves with thousands and thousands of new treatment centers that were buying policies from people on the for people on the street, okay? They could make twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars Jesus by putting this person in treatment, and then they would pay the individual to go into treatment. Jesus. They call it body brokering. Well, that's okay? a, that's a, that's and and I've heard these stories where they will go and get literally homeless people off the street and pay them to jump on the wagon, and then they bring them in. It's, it's a, exactly right. It's horrible. They put them in a hotel room, shoot them full of heroin. And then put them in treatment and get paid five, six thousand dollars a head. These people yeah. are almost like murderers. I mean, it's this is this yeah, is they, they are. There's no question. I've reported, you know, probably thirty of them over the last few years. Eleven My of them God. have been indicted here in the last few months. You know, it, it's just going to put a small dent. In it. Now it, we have another problem now, and that is the insurance companies have flexed their muscles. And as of January 1st, 2018, they cut all the chemical dependency benefits out of all the exchange and Obamacare policies. So they no longer cover treatment for, for chemical dependency. <clears throat> so that, that whole, you know, idea, they, they came out of the, out of the uh, gate with really strong benefits. Obama made a promise to health net. Don't worry, you're going to make a profit because all these young people are going to buy these policies and yada, yada, yada. Well, we know it didn't turn out that way, okay? No. Um, a guy like me, my, my monthly uh, rate on my, my Mike Torricelli, rate. I wish I had two hours. Mike, thank you so much. Mike Torricelli, ladies and gentlemen, one of the experts on opioid dependency treatment in this country, has saved 15,000 people. Well, remember, even when we're not on the air, you can hear us and see us and read all about us at jackberkmanradio.com and always at radioamerica.com. Thanks. We'll see you next week.